SOCs are one of the greatest things to ever happen to embedded computing. Instead of crowding your board with a bunch of chips doing all the things in your system, memory interfaces, peripherals, bus-based super widgets... Yeah, I made that last one up. Instead of all that, you can buy an SOC that has exactly the right mixture of peripherals and accessories you need, the right combination and speed of processors, and the right accelerators for things like DSP function. Uh, wait a second. This catalog has about a thousand different SOCs, and none of them have exactly the combination of things I need. Great. Okay, maybe SOCs aren't quite the greatest things yet, but looky here. Altera has SOCs that I can configure to have just what I need, with the power of FPGA fabric right on the same chip. That's handy. How do you design with one of these things? Well, hang around and you'll find out. Hi, I'm Amelia Dalton, host of Chalk Talk. A lot of us have heard about the new game-changing devices that combine ARM-based SOCs with FPGA fabric. These are some of the most exciting devices to hit the market in the last decade. Today, my guest is Todd Kelling from Altera, and we're going to dive in and learn what's inside these new SOC FPGAs and how you can get started designing with them. And don't forget to click either one of those Download Now buttons below your player. There you can download two free white papers entitled Error Correction Code in SOC FPGA-Based Memory Systems and User Customizable ARM-Based SOC FPGAs for Next Generation Embedded Systems. Thank you so much for joining me today, Todd. Thank you, Amelia. It's great to be here. So there have been processors and FPGAs for a while now. How have those caught on? That's correct, and they've actually caught on very well. I think if we look at soft processors such as our NEOS 2 processor and FPGAs, that's been a very popular and very successful device. And people have also tried to do integrated hard processors, though, though those maybe haven't taken off quite as much, uh -huh. but they're also popular as well. If we look at the overall trend, we'll see that the processor usage in FPGAs has continued to increase over the years, such that we see it crossing over 50% by the year 2014. Wow, okay. So it seems like over that time span, embedded design has changed a lot. What are the challenges that embedded designers are struggling with today? You know, these struggles are actually age old. They've been around for years. I yeah. think em embedded designers are facing the same issues of increasing the system performance, reducing the power, mm -hmm. reducing the board size, reducing their cost. They've got to get a system to market even quicker than before yeah. with less resources, and it's got to be different and better than everyone else's. Absolutely. So what is Altera doing to address these issues? Well, we actually do have a, a very innovative product line that we think is going to help dramatically in this area, and it's what we're calling our ARM-based SOCs. Okay. And what we've done, Amelia, is combine a state-of-the-art ARM dual-core Cortex-A9 processor system with our latest and greatest FPGAs, the Cyclone 5 and ARIA 5 FPGAs, into a single device. Okay, that's really cool. I can have my ARM processing subsystem and my FPGA in the same device. It seems like that would let us do a lot of cool things. What are some of the benefits of this integration? You're right, it is really cool. And I think it addresses those four areas of challenge we just saw for the embedded designers today. First of all, your system performance can go up dramatically. We're seeing up to 1600 GMAX or 300 GFLOPs on the DSP side. We also have very high-speed processor to FPGA interconnect that doing on the board, you just can't run it that fast. Sure. The power consumption also comes down. You've, you've got less uh, real estate, less parts out there. And obviously, the board size can be condensed as well, mm -hmm. the board space. And then overall, you, you'll experience a reduction in system cost. It's not only the component count itself, but also that PCB savings, the trace savings, so on and so on. It, it really adds up. That makes sense. So historically, the processors and FPGAs haven't been the highest performance processors out there. But that isn't the case here, right? That's correct. It's not true this time around. We've definitely put in a very powerful dual-core ARM Cortex-A9 processor subsystem into this device. It's, it's really state-of-the-art as far as this goes. So it's got the dual-issue superscalar pipeline, 2.5 MIPS per megahertz, 
running at 800 megahertz in, even at industrial temp. So this is a very powerful processor system. One more option we also provide is we also give a single core option. For many people, this may be too much, but mm. in those cases, we offer a single core option that would still be enough power for many designs. Okay, so let's dive down into the details of this new SOC architecture. Let's take a closer look at the processor system first. We call this the hard processor system because all this logic is hardened into the device. Okay. In the upper left there of the blue section of the diagram, you'll see the dual core RMA9. Each of those cores has its own neon and floating point units, as okay. well as a dedicated L1 cache just for its own use. Then the two of those share an L2 cache. And then around that, we've surrounded it with a host of common peripherals that people like to use. So example, your USB 2.0 on the go, the mm -hmm. triple speed Ethernet Max, and so on and so forth. So that offers a wide range of peripherals already built in that you can choose from. Great. Now on the FPGA side, as I mentioned, we're using the latest Cyclone 5 and ARIA 5 devices, and that's a 28 nanometer low power process. On top of that, we also have hardened devices down there. We have a hard PCIe controller, high-speed mm -hmm. transceivers for your communications and networking, and then also additional memory controllers for the FPGA. Okay, Todd, I see the processor part and the FPGA part. How is this different than having a processor next to an FPGA? Well, the key here is that we don't just want to slam those two together and think it's going to work great. The key is you've got to have plenty of bandwidth. You've got to have a large enough pipe between those two devices such that it doesn't become the bottleneck mm. in those transfers. And so using this on the same piece of silicon, we can run much faster than you could across PCB traces. And in fact, our bus is designed, it's an AXI-based interconnect, can run over 125 gigabits per second, which is extremely fast. Wow, okay. So one of the things that FPGAs are known for is accelerating things like DSP algorithms. Do these devices have stuff to help with that? That is true, and FPGAs are very well renowned for their DSP performance. And with these devices, we have the variable precision DSP block that are used in the ARIA 5 and Cyclo 5 FPGAs, which support on a block-by-block -block basis various precisions ranging from 9 by 9 bit up to single precision floating point within a single DSP block. So this frees people from the FPGA architecture restrictions, allowing them to use the optimum precision at each stage of the DSP data path. And you will also benefit from increased system performance and reduced power consumption using this sort of configuration. Okay, so I think I see a problem here. FPGAs have to be configured when you start them up. And if you've got a processing subsystem on board, doesn't that cause a problem? Well, actually not. We did think ahead very seriously on this, and you can do the traditional approach of booting the processor first in the system uh -huh. and then configuring the FPGA, but we also offer the option to boot the FPGA first and maybe secure the rest of the system and then bring the processor up. Ah, oh, okay. All right, or you could boot both of them independently. So we've given users a wide range of options there depending on their system needs. So eventually we're going to have to get signals on and off our SOC. How do we handle I.O. between the FPGA side and the processor side? So the way the device is set up, we do have a portion of I.O.s that are dedicated to the HPS. And you can select which peripherals you want to use that I showed you earlier and then route those out. And then on the FPGA side, of course, it has its own I.O.s as well. But we also offer the ability that you can tap through the FPGA into the HPS and use some of those pins if those aren't used already. So it's a very configurable setup. Okay, so we've talked about the FPGA part and the processor part, but processors need memory. What do you have in terms of memory support? That is part of what makes this an SOC or a system on chip, that we also have built in a hard memory controller for the processor system. And this supports all of your leading DRAM, the DDR2, DDR3, and the low-power DDR2, anywhere from a 400 to 533 megahertz range. The other key thing we've added, because of some of the markets that might be using this in terms of industrial or automotive, mm 
mm-hmm. medical systems, that error correction code is absolutely essential. Ah. And so you can't help with memory sizes getting larger, that inevitably there may be some errors in either the, the device itself or the transmission. But through this error correction code, you can actually detect those, detect up to double bit errors, and you can correct single bit errors. So this makes the data integrity of the system much more robust. Okay, that covers the processor side. FPGAs need memory too, right? That's right, and we also have hard memory controllers in the FPGA section as well. And that can range in from one in our Cyclone 5 devices up to three in the larger ARIA class devices. And this is very nice because then the FPGA has its own access to memory. Mm. A good example of this would be a video controller card sitting on PCIe, for example. Okay. So that PCIe data can stream directly off of PCIe. That video can go directly off PCIe into the FPGA memory while you're running an Ethernet protocol stack on the processor system using its own memory. Ah. So that way those don't conflict and have to be shared. That makes sense. So we've talked about memory. Do you have a really colorful diagram you could show us? <laughs> you betcha. We, we've got one right here. Okay, let's talk about this idea of accelerating algorithms. That's right. This is an exciting idea and worthy of a colorful diagram. One of the main benefits of this combination of the processor plus FPGA is you can then build the hardware accelerators into this system and keep them cache coherent with the processor memory. Ah, okay. Now, in the past, you could do this, but this would be a really almost a supercomputing style sort of approach. Mm -hmm. But now you can do this in a very straightforward way. And how this is done is through a key technology here called the Acceleration Coherency Port, or the ACP, that we've built in. And this will track your FPGA accesses to the L2 cache or the main memory and keep all those coherent so that when the processor accesses that, your memory is still coherent. All right, Todd, we've talked a lot about performance, but power is a really big deal for embedded designers as well, right? That's correct, and the foundation of power is the process technology. And again, this is an area we gave a lot of thought to in designing these devices. So at Altera, there's two basic approaches you can take. You can optimize for power, or you can optimize for speed. And then, of course, the cost is kind of a side impact of that. And so for the ARIA-5 and the Cyclone-5 class of devices that we're using in these SOCs, we chose to optimize for the power and cost side of the equation. And to do that, we're using the TSMC 28 nanometer low power process. Okay. Meanwhile, if you really want the blazing performance, then that's in our Stratix class devices. And so they use the 28 nanometer HP process, and that would be more of your high-end sort of approach. Okay. So that's what the process is doing to save power, but Mm -hmm. you guys have done a lot on the architecture side as well, correct? That's correct. And with the process technology we just talked about, for your processor system at 4,000 MIPS, which is a lot of performance, you can get less than 1.8 watts. That's for the processor system only. But going beyond that, we did implement independent power planes between the FPGA and the processor system. And so when you're in a standby state or or you're just waiting for some sort of signal, you still need to keep the processor running, but you can actually power down the FPGA. Ah. And that's going to cause substantial savings in terms of your standby power. The other thing we've done is build in different power modes, different features to turn things on and off. And and you can read some of them there on the slide, but we have different processor sleep modes, also low power memory controller modes that enable you to turn on and off or slow down different parts of the system to save power that way. Very nice. All right. So, Todd, it seems like I would need a whole different set of tools than I have for my regular SOC. You know, actually, no. We didn't want this to be a barrier for people. And so we've gone with the standard industry tools on both the processor side as well as on the FPGA side. Great. So for the standard FPGA flow, as shown on the the left here, you can use our Altera industry-leading Quartus II system design tools, as well as the QSIS integration and so on. We also have the signal tap logic analysis and then your programming tools for that FPGA portion. On the right-hand side, for programming the processor portion of the device, there the key is that it's ARM compatible. So Mm -hmm. we're leveraging the ARM ecosystem and that wealth of tools and capabilities that are already out there. 
So we're talking about developing hardware and software both here, right? How can we help the software guys get started while the hardware work is already going on? Do the software guys just get to go to Maui and hang out for a couple weeks while the hardware guys are still slaving away? Well, they certainly could go to Maui. That, uh, that wouldn't be a bad idea. <laughs> but uh, when they returned, it might be a little challenging. Yes. <laughs> So what we've done is, in order to get the software engineers a, a jump start on that code development, we created what we call the virtual target. And, and this is a, a virtual prototyping tool that, that has a model of this processor system that they can run on a, a standard Windows or Linux-based PC. And, and the reason we did this, Amelia, was in developing this solution, we saw that it's actually the software development that takes the longest lead time in these sort of projects. Mm -hmm. In fact, it can be up to 18 months for a very sophisticated dual-core ARM A9 system. And so with this virtual target, the software engineers can get rolling right away on different operating systems on Linux, VxWorks, Micro CoS2. They can get their code developed ahead of time so that when the hardware designers are ready with a board, they can immediately port that code over. Very nice. Okay, switching back over to the hardware side, we've got all this flexibility to add any combination of peripherals we want. How do we put all of those together? Right. The challenge here is there are many hard peripherals we talked about already in the processor system. There are many that the hardware designer may want to create and implement in the FPGA portion of the device, either hardware accelerators for the different algorithms or different peripherals that they want to add on or, or have more of. And so to do this, we have our QSYS system integration tool. And this is actually our second generation tool. It's very easy to use. But with this, the hardware designer can choose the different IP blocks that they want to stitch together and then connect them either via our Avalon bus interfaces from Altera or using the standard ARM AXI 3 and AXI 4 buses. Okay, now that we have our hardware and our software designed, how are we going to debug this thing once we have everything merged together? That's correct. This is a new paradigm that needs to be addressed. And so to tackle this, we worked with ARM to develop a specific version of their ARM Development Studio 5 or DS5 toolkit that's targeted for these devices. With the ARM DS5 Altera Edition toolkit, you can now debug both the FPGA and the ARM processor system simultaneously. Wow, cool. Okay. So what this does is it removes the debugging barrier between the two and using a single USB blaster target connection you can debug both the hardware and the software. Some of the advantages of this are that you can do hardware cross-triggering between the CPU and the FPGA. So in other words, if an event happens in the processor that you're looking for, you can then see the status of the FPGA at that time. Mm -hmm. Or vice versa, if there's something you're looking for in the FPGA, you can then check and see what the CPU is doing at that moment. Then the other thing that's really nice about this is you can do statistical analysis of the software load and bus traffic between both the CPU and the FPGA. Wow. So this is really an exciting new way to look at both sides of this device at the same time. Okay, Todd, I think I'm ready to get started with this. Can you tell us what's available and where we need to go for more information? Sure. These exciting, innovative new products are ready to get designed now. And the first place to start is with the tools. Sure. So as we mentioned, for the software engineer, the best idea is for you to get your hands on this virtual target and start developing your software code. And for the hardware engineer, get your hands on the Quartus 2 and the QSYS system development tools and get programming there. From there, we do have silicon available. You could also get a dev kit and then begin the, the actual board bring up and process there. Well, I think that's all I have time for today. Thank you so much for joining me today, Todd. Sure. Thanks, Amelia. We appreciate the uh, chance to be here and hope that all of you out there will find these to be very exciting and usable products. And before we go, don't forget to click either one of those Download Now buttons below your player. There you can download two free white papers entitled Error Correction Code in SOC FPGA-Based Memory Systems and User Customizable ARM-Based SOC FPGAs for Next Generation Embedded Systems. For Chalk Talk, I'm Amelia Dalton. For more Chalk Talks, check out the On Demand section of eejournal.com.